page 113. page 177. Keep fellowship and tell someone you love them this morning.
one more song. You can be seated if you'd like to. We're going to sing There's Power in the Blood, page 390. Y'all believe there's power in the blood? Amen. If there wasn't no power, I wouldn't be saved today. Thank God there's enough power in the blood of Christ to save the whole world if they would just call on his name. So let's sing There is Power in the Blood. Sometimes in life, we, um, as people, need to be reminded of the person that we used to be. Now, let me, add, let me, let me just add to what I'm saying. I, I'm not talking about remembering the person you used to be to go back and be that person. But remember the person you used to be to see where God has brought you from. Amen. Amen. The, the Bible says the man that grabs hold of the plow... And looks back, desiring to go back to what he or she used to be, is not fit for the kingdom. But I often find myself reminded of who that I used to be. And where God has brought me from. Listen, I'm blessed this morning. I look back at the 29 years of serving God. And I see the person I was then to where I'm at now. And you know what? There's no comparison. It's as night and day, the change that God has made in my life. Now, that doesn't mean that I haven't made mistakes along the way. That doesn't mean that I haven't failed God along the way. That doesn't mean that I haven't been a disappointment to people in this life. But I can rest assure you there was a change made in my life that I have never, ever forgotten. You know what I want to do this morning? I just want to thank Jesus for that. 
I want Sister Kennedy to come. She sang this song last Sunday, and I believe last Sunday night. And it talks about, thank you, Jesus, for the blood that was applied. Can I, can I say something to you? Without the shedding of innocent blood, there would be no remission of sin. In other words, there would be no way that I could be saved. There's no way that you could be saved, that this world could be saved. But aren't you thankful because of the blood of Jesus Christ? You and I could be saved. And you know what? I want us to just sing this song with her. You know it. Sing it with her. If you want to praise the Lord, you stand and do it. If you want to take a lap, take a lap. If you want to come to the altar, come to the altar. But listen to me. Listen to the words. And thank Jesus for the blood that was applied in your life. From the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide. Left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe. Broke my chains, freed my soul, for the first time I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have seen. my place and laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood Darkness into 
We'd like to dismiss the junior church, ages four and under. You can be dismissed. And it seems like everyone is quiet this morning. And maybe it's uh, because you, uh, God needs to speak to us. Um, I'm not sure. But we're going to do our best to be mindful of the Spirit of the Lord today. Everybody else, if you have your Bibles, we want you to open them up to the book of Ephesians. Chapter number five. And let me say this before you stand. We have been preaching a series of messages. Now, these messages have not been um, week by week. This has been over a period of time. Uh, we've been preaching on redeeming the times. And that simply means that we need to take advantage uh, of the day and age that we live in. And let me say this to you this morning. I don't know what you're dealing with, what you're going through, who you are. But today you need to take advantage of what is laid out before you. Preacher, I'm not sure, what, uh, I'm not sure that I understand what you're saying. Well, can I say this, that if you don't know the Lord, you need to be saved today. Amen. The Bible says now is the accepted time. Right. Today, right now is the day of salvation. I don't believe in coincidences. I don't believe that you're here because uh, by chance. I don't believe that you're here uh, by coincidence. I believe you're here because God ordained this day. I believe that God saw years ago that you would be here this day. And today you need to take advantage of the opportunity that you have to come to know the Lord. For you that's not walking where you need to be with God, you need to take advantage of the situation. And if you haven't guessed, that's the title of today's message, Taking Advantage of the Situation. God's people in the book of 
uh, in the Old Testament under the old law, God told them on the backside of a desert, they had been exiled out from Egypt for 40 years. They were on this, in this desert. Moses had led them there. On the way out of Egypt, uh, the Canaan land or the promised land was just over the top of the hill, but they had to go past the Philistines. They understood that they were not children of war. They had no idea how to fight. So God began to train them, take them on the backside of the desert, take them through the Red Sea, and to show them that they had to trust in God. He said, I'll give you land. He says, I'll give you food to eat. I'll give you water to drink, but you have to trust in me. Can I tell you today, you have to trust in the Lord. You're not going to make heaven your home by anything that you do on your own merit, on your own good works. Nothing that you do will get you to heaven. You have to trust the Lord. If, you're walked, if you've walked away from God, you may be hard on yourself and say, there's no way that God can ever forgive me. Listen to me. Notice this. There's only one sin that God cannot forgive, and that is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit of God. So I don't care what you've done, where you've been, how long you've been in it. I don't care how deep you are in it. God can, God will forgive you of your sin. The Bible says He is faithful and He is just. But on the back side of that desert, God's people begin to murmur and complain. They uh, chide with, against Moses. They said, have you not brought us out here to, to starve to death and we have no place to bury our dead? You know what they were wanting to do? They were wanting to go back where they came from. They wanted to go back under the bondage of sin. Can I tell you, when Jesus set you free, you're free indeed. You don't have to go back into the bondage. Though that may be your comfort zone, that may be the place where you feel most, uh, uh, the most security. Can I tell you? Uh, the devil will make you believe there is security in sin because there is pleasure in sin. But I'm thankful there's joy in Christ. My point I'm trying to make this morning, taking advantage of every situation, as God took those children back on the backside of that desert, he began to teach them to trust in him. And he says this, I'll give you food every day. And the food that I'm going to give you is not going to last, but it's called manna from heaven. And in the morning, the Bible says that manna would fall from heaven. And he says, make sure you get just enough to fill your tummy. Don't try to put it in your satchel. Don't try to take any home with anybody. He says, get what you want, how much you need. And he says, leave the rest there because if you try to take it home, it's going to rot. Can I tell you today, you've got to take advantage of every situation. If you're lost, you need to be saved. If you're away from God, you need to come back today. And listen, if you're a Christian and you need to do more for God, then you need to come today and take advantage of the very situation that God has placed you in today. The book of Ephesians, chapter 5, if you're there, say amen. amen. The Bible says this. So if you would, you know what, don't even stand. I just want to read some scripture to you this morning. In verse number 15, it says, Seeing then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are are evil wherefore be ye not unwise but understanding what the will of the lord is and be not drunk with wine bread, uh, wherein is in excess but be filled with the spirit speaking unto yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your hearts to the lord giving thanks always for all things unto god and the father in the name of our lord jesus christ submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God how many of you remember that message I preached a few weeks ago called don't worry be happy you remember that message raise your hand you know what that was one of those messages that you don't forget and the title of course you, it's hard to forget that title and and it's hard to forget the song that came with that title don't worry be happy now, how many of you in the, uh, in the past few weeks since that message was preached, don't raise your hands, found yourself worrying about things you couldn't control? Huh? Yeah, we preached on how that we need to trust in the Lord. And, and with all of our hearts, you, you know, when you trust in God, you don't have to worry, do you? And then you give yourself completely to God. And if you do those things, then God would give you the desires of your heart. Right? We preach that out of Psalm 37. But you know what? When you preach a message like that, can I tell you something? The devil doesn't like it. The devil doesn't like for you not to worry. 
The devil doesn't like for you not to fret. So what does he do? He begins to come and he begins to see, uh, sow seeds of doubt, seeds of complaining. Amen? Hey, listen, when you preach that message and you start trusting in God, the first thing he does is he comes at you and throws everything he can at you. He causes these thoughts to come, these thoughts of fear, these thoughts of doubt. And before you know it, you're focused on your surroundings and you're back worse what you were before you ever heard the message, don't worry, be happy. You know what? That's his job. The Bible teaches us in the book of, book of uh, Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, he says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt you in due time. In verse 7, it says this, Casting all of your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because, notice this, your adversary. You know what? Every one of us has an adversary. You've got an enemy. Somebody doesn't like you. More importantly, it's not about who doesn't like you, but the one that despises you, the one that wants to come to you and to steal, kill, and destroy everything that God has blessed you with. Hey, listen, if you allow the devil to put doubt in your mind, you'll start doubting God, you'll start doubting the church, you'll start doubting the pastor, you'll start doubting the gospel, amen, but I'm telling you if you cast all of your cares upon him why because he says for he careth for you Amen. he said be sober be vigilant for your adversary the devil notice this as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour and we've been preaching on this very subject for a few weeks now about redeeming the times and that simply means to take advantage of every opportunity. Can I tell you something, church? We, right now, in today's day and age, have a great opportunity to be a great influence on the world in which we live. Hey, can I tell you, there is power in His name. There is power in the blood of Christ. And you know what? That same power that is in His name, that is in His power, has been instilled and in inside of you. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You folks are awful quiet this morning. Maybe you're just taking advantage of the message that God is giving you this morning. What an opportunity we really have. Can I share something with you this morning? We are living, Brother Mike, in the most unprecedented times that we have ever endured. In the history of mankind. You know, the Bible talks about how there'd be wars and rumors of wars. There'd be pestilences. There would be earthquakes in diverse places. Those things are happening as we speak. Did you know that? You know what that means? That means soon the Lord's coming back. Hey, he's coming back. Preacher, you prophesying that? Yes, I'm prophesying. The Lord is coming back. Oh, when's he coming back? This I don't know. The Bible says not even Jesus knew when he would come back right. but I do know this by the authority of God's Word he is coming back Amen. and I can tell you with authority through the Word of God that it won't be long Amen it won't be long. Well, preacher how long is not that long well I'm gonna tell you what this life that I live is just a vapor it's appeared for a little while and then it vanishes away you know what that tells me we're closer to home today than what we were yesterday thank God listen he's coming back and if he doesn't come back before I leave this life I know where I'm going the Bible teaches us in the book of 2nd Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 notice this Paul writes to Timothy and says this know also he says you need to know this that in the last days perilous times shall come that means dangerous that means uncertain that means things will be turned upside down are we not there today church Amen. the Bible goes on to say for men shall be lovers of their own selves I'll let that one soak in for a moment for men shall be lovers of their own selves he goes on to say covetous boasters proud blasphemers disobedient to parents how are we not in a day and age where kids today are so disrespectful to their parents and no I don't blame the children I blame the parents I see that went over well blasphemers disobedient to parents unthankful unthankful sometimes we are so unthankful for what God has done 
I couldn't pay you a million dollars to stand up and testify. Oh, but I should not have to give you a dime for the blessings that God has bestowed upon your life. You should want to stand up and say, God, I have not been the best to you. Oh, but God, I want to thank you because you have been so good to me. Has not God been good to you? Am I the only one today that God has been good to? He saved me. He's kept me. He's made me a fit subject for the kingdom of God. And bless God, I don't know about you, but one day I'm going to make my long journey home. I'm going to say goodbye over here and hell over on the other side. Amen. That's the hope that I have of the promise that is in Jesus Christ. He says there would be traitors, heady, high-minded lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away they had a form of godliness that means they looked on the outside like the part that they were professing but on the inside it's nothing but ravening wolves can I tell you listen to me church there are a lot of people that's dressing the part they're pretending the part but they're not a part of the part I'm not talking about listen to me church I'm talking about those that are pretenders and not contenders they're pretending to fight the good fight. They're pretending to follow Christ. The Bible says that you'll know them by the fruits that they bear. We preached, of course, on how that we needed to walk circumspectly. As Paul writes here in the book of Ephesians, he says you need to walk circumspectly. That means every way, all around, cautiously, you need to pay attention, uh, upright and cautiously, with a watchfulness in every way, and the attention to guard against surprise or danger. You know what amazes me? How many people, when troubles and trials come, or the devil attacks them, they sit back, they say, woe is me, and they don't understand why. Can I tell you what the Bible says? It rains on the just as well as the unjust. And I don't like to go through trials or troubles or tribulations or any type of sickness. But I've come to realize in this life that it's going to happen one way or the other. It's just what we call life. Can I tell you, one day though, church, we'll step foot on the other side. There'll be no more sickness. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more death. Oh, for the former things that we once experienced will just be a figment of our imagination. Preacher, how sure are you of that? I'm as sure as I'm standing here that Jesus, the one, the author and finisher of the faith in which I believe in, will one day call me home and I'll just say good Goodbye over here and hello over yonder. Amen. Taking advantage of the situation. We need to walk as children. God's children. We need to be a light and a beacon in this world. We need to be careful of what we say, what we do, where we go. Amen. Because someone's watching. And when someone's not watching... Someone's always watching. I pray that wakes you up about midnight. And what's he talking about? Someone's always watching. There's an all-seeing eye of God that knows everything about you, knows the thoughts, knows the hairs that's on your head or lack thereof in my case. God knows everything there is to know about you. There's not a thought that comes and goes, not a deed that goes unseen that God doesn't look at. Can I tell you something, friend? We need to walk circumspectly. We need to watch cautiously because there is one that wants to deceive you, discourage you, and cause you not to want anything to do with God. Oh, but can I tell you with God's help, with God's protection, and through his word, through the preached word of God, we can have assurance in knowing this, church. Listen, there is one that reigns. Listen to me. He reigns, he reigns, he reigns. His name is King Jesus. Can I tell you something, church? That old lion. He might want to roar and pretend to be a lion, but can I tell you there's only one lion, and he is a lion of the true tribe of Judah, and his name is Jesus Christ, and he's coming back one day. What else do we need to take advantage of? I want you to notice with me, in verse number 16, or verse 15, he says, See then that you walk circumspectly. I, I encourage you 
to walk worthy of the calling that God has in your life. Let me say this and I'll move on. If you're going to say and confess to be a Christian, I'm going to make her plain, then live like a Christian. Now I'll move on. What else should we take advantage of? Redeeming the time, verse 16, because the days are evil. Verse 17, wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. You know what you need to take advantage of today? Not only walking circumspectly, but you need to understand what the will of the Lord is for you. I know it's quiet. You want to know why? Because Pastor Mark's going to tell you what the will of the Lord is for you. Listen to me. I don't know what God is for you, what his will is for you. But I do know what God's will for all of mankind. As a child of God, you must understand what God's will is for you in your life. That's what the writer says. He says, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And one of the hardest things that I've come to determine as a Christian, as a preacher, and as a pastor is sometimes trying to understand what the will of God is. Well, preacher, what's that mean? It's simply this, what God would have you to do. What God would have you to be. And when we think of those things, we're like, what well, does God want me to preach? Does God want me to teach? It's not about preaching. It's not about teaching. Can I tell you this? All of you are called to preach the word. Amen. Well, preacher, I don't believe in women preaching, and I don't believe in women serving authority in the church. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not what he's talking about. Jesus gave us the great commission, but we've made it the great suggestion. Jesus didn't suggest that we go into all the world and preach the gospel. He says, this commandment I give you, that you go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Preacher, I don't know how to preach. Yes, you do. If you're saved, you have a testimony. You have a message. You know what the message is? You know what the gospel is? It is a message from a far country. It is good news. The Bible says, as cold water is to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. You mean to tell me you've not got nothing good to say about God? You mean to tell me you've got nothing good to say about what Jesus Christ did for you 2,000 years ago at a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull, at Calvary? You mean to tell me you don't remember the day that you got saved and how defeated you were, how unworthy you felt that you could be, how sin-filled that you were? Oh, but then there was one. Oh, by the name of Jesus Christ, he passed by your way. You accepted him as Savior. And you mean to tell me you ain't got nothing to say to him? A simple testimony of how Jesus saved your life is preaching the gospel. I can't explain it. All I know is I was lost and undone. He came, passed by my way. He convicted my heart, told me that I needed to have a relationship with his son. The only thing I knew to do was to fall on my knees and on my face and say, God, I'm a sinner. And God, because of that, I need a Savior. And God, if you'll just save me, I promise you, I'll serve you all the days of my life. And you know what he did? He saved me. You know what? What I just said about what happened to me could save the world. Because it wasn't what I did, it's what he did. And we need to take advantage of every opportunity that God gives us. You mean to tell me that no one wants to know about Jesus anymore? No one wants to know about heaven anymore? No one wants to know the fact that they're going to die? You see, we don't want to talk about death anymore because it scares us to death. I'd be scared too if you wasn't right with God. Well, I don't want to get saved just be, and be scared to get saved. I'll tell you what, it scared me enough that I got saved. I didn't want to go to hell. I didn't want to die lost. I didn't want to be separated from God. I didn't want to be separated from my family. I didn't want to be separated into eternity at a place called hell. And you know what? If it scared me enough to get saved, I'm going to tell you what, it must have worked because I'm still saved today. Lord, if you're not going to shout, I'm going to. Whoop. 
I'm glad I'm saved today. And we need to take advantage of every opportunity. What is God's will for you? Do you know what that is? It's the Great Commission. We've already said it. Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Can I ask you something? Is God happy with you? Is God happy with you? Is God happy with your testimony? Is God happy with your actions? Is God happy with your mouth? Is God happy with who you are? Do you represent him well? Listen, do you lift him up or do you just play the part? Oh, yes, I'm a Christian. I, it amazes me how many people die and they're members of the, the Centerburg Free Will Baptist Church, but this old pastor has never met them. Amen. Just maybe because they visited a church or maybe because they were a member of a family member that's a member of this church. I, want to, I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news, and I hope that I'm not quenching the spirit. But listen, just because your name is or is not on this church roll, it ain't going to have no effect on you getting to heaven or not. Amen. <laughs> I'd rather be a part of no church and make heaven my home is to be a part of a church and go to hell. Amen. Relying on the church and its name and the denomination or even the pastor. I'm going to tell you what, if you're following me, you may be going down a wrong road. <laughs> I'll do my best to follow Christ. But I'm telling you, there's roadblocks along the way. There's detours along the way. And sometimes, yes, this old preacher even finds himself off the right road. Because remember, there's none good, none perfect. But I know God's faithful. Is God pleased with you? What makes God happy with you? We know God's will for every man, boy, woman, and girl is this is that none should perish. The Bible teaches that. That's, that's God's will for all of mankind. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but He is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So I can tell you this with a surety. If you're here today, you're lost, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you need to be saved. That's God's will for you. He doesn't want you to die lost. You mean to tell me, preacher, that God would send me to hell? No, because you've heard the gospel and you refuse to accept Jesus Christ. You've made that decision. But God has to honor his word. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. There are rules that need to be applied in order for us to get to heaven. You can't go in the back way. There's no back doors to heaven. There may be 12 gates, but those gates are locked and there's only one door you're getting in. Well, I'll climb over the wall. Then you're the same as a thief and a robber. And you can't get in. And don't think that you're going to try to trick Jesus to let you in either. Don't think that you're going to try to sneak your way in like you used to at the amusement park. Or the county fair. Or in some of you older folks, the movie theater. Get in the trunk as many as we can. We're going to the drive-in. You think I'm stupid? More importantly, do you think God's stupid? God knows. He knows every man, every woman, every boy and every girl. He knows the souls that have been, is today, and will ever be. Amen. That's how good God is. How do I know what God's will? Can I give you two things this morning, and I'll close. Two things this morning that you need to know about God's will. This is for every person. Notice what it said. In redeeming the time, verse 16, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So what is the will of the Lord? First of all, uh, first of two things is this. Notice in verse number 19, speaking, oh, I'm sorry, verse 18, and be drunk, be not drunk with wine, which is in excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. I'm going to say this, hope I don't offend anybody, but some of you don't even know, wouldn't have no idea what the Spirit of God is if He slapped you upside the head. I don't mean that to be disrespectful, but that's just where you are in your life because you refuse to allow the Spirit of God to work in your life. 
understanding what the will of the Lord is. Notice the very first thing that Paul says when understanding the will of the Lord is, he says, be drunk not with wine, but he says this, but be filled with the Spirit. Notice the word spirit. It ain't your spirit. It's a capital spirit. That means the Holy Spirit. A lot of people are afraid. They won't use that word spirit, Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost. It scares them to death. You want to know why it scares people to death? Because when the Spirit of God is inside of you and it moves in you, you'll do things, you'll say things that you normally wouldn't say or do. He takes you out of your comfort zone. How many times have you sit there and God has pressed on your heart to stand up and give a testimony, stand up and give a song, or stand up and just say, Oh God, I want to thank you. Maybe raise a hanky, maybe raise a hand, maybe two hands. Yet you sit there, you cross your arms and say, God, I don't want to be an embarrassment. God, I don't want people to look at me. Listen, I'm not here for you to look at me. I'm here to exalt the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one that saved my soul. Bible says to exalt the Lord. Give him praise. We lack praise. You want to know why? Because we're afraid someone will say something to us or think something of us. Bible says let him that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Y'all got a voice. I've heard some of you wives yelling at your husbands. I know you do. Some of you husbands yelling at your wives. I know you do. But yet we can't say praises unto God. God has done so much for us. Listen, taken care of us, fed us. Hey, the Bible says not a hair falls from your head that God doesn't know about. The sparrows, hey, listen, Jesus Christ. And hey, listen, he didn't have a place to lay his head. He said the Bible says the foxes had holes, the birds of the nest, or the air had nests. But the Son of God had no place to lay his head. Yet he cares for you. Be filled with the Spirit. Two ways that you'll know that you're filled with the Spirit. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit of God? How do you know that you're filled with the Spirit of God? First of all, you'll know. Are you ready? Are you on your seat? You want to know how you're, you're filled with the Spirit of God? There'll be a transformation in your life. What's that mean? That means there'll be a change. I've heard a lot of people say that they got saved. I heard a lot of people say they're members of churches. I've heard a lot of people say they pay their tithes. I've heard a lot of people say I never miss service. But you know what I've noticed in some of these folks? I never see a change. And I'm going to step out on God's word and give you layman's terms. If there is no change, there is no Jesus. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, oh my goodness, church, do you want scripture this morning? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16, 17. Can I tell you, in January the 12th, 1993, there was a change that came in my life. And yes, I've not been perfect. I've not been good. But can I tell you, there was a change that was made. Here's the greatest part about the change. I didn't have to do nothing. I didn't have to stop drinking. I didn't have to stop doing drugs. I didn't have to start doing the things of this world. But you know what happened? He took them from me. You see, here's the problem with the church and most Christians today. You want to go out and you want to clean people up before you ever get them to church. Let me tell you something, friend. You got to get them lost before you ever get them saved. You know how I knew I was lost? Because somebody told me. Oh, God forbid we tell someone they're lost. You can't judge me. No, I'm not judging. I'm just telling you what God's word says. Except a man be born again. He cannot see the king. Well, I'm saved. I accepted Jesus. Well, where's the fruits that say that? Well, you can't, you don't know me. I'm not perfect. Well, Lord, no, I know you're not perfect. You're not even good. Matter of fact, you're heathen right now. Well, you can't say that about me. Listen to me, church. You have an obligation to sharpen the iron. That's what the Bible says, that iron sharpens iron. I'm not talking about casting judgment. I'm not talking about telling someone they're going to hell. I'm talking about this. If you're going to live for Christ, start acting like it. There ought to be a change. 
That's the first way that you'll know if somebody's filled with the Spirit of God. There'll be a change. I could take you to DSW, get you the best shoes, best suit, best dress, best tie, best anything you want. But you're just looking the part. You see, when Jesus changes us, he changes us from the inside out, not the outside in. When I got saved, I still looked the same on the outside. But there was a change on the inside. And because of the change on the inside, then it began to show on the outside. That's how you know that you're filled with the Spirit of God. Maybe y'all didn't like that one. I got one more for you. You see, I said that we're all afraid of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit of God. I'm going to tell you what, I pray the Holy Spirit shows up here every service. And I know I'm bringing him with me. All I need is one more volunteer. <laughs> Amen. Like I said, he's God. That means you ain't got it. You, the rest of you folks ain't stand a chance. Whether you bring him or not, he's here. And you know what? Because he's here, I can live. I can praise him. I can preach. I can sing about him. Listen, if he's not here, we're just gathering. We're just having a place of fellowship. And you know what good is that going to do if Jesus Christ doesn't show up? That's why we're here today. Listen, I don't want to go to heaven if Jesus isn't there. He said he'd be with us, didn't he? Did he not say... Brother Todd, did he not say he wouldn't forsake us? He said he'd never leave us. I'm thankful for that. So you know that the first thing for God in your will, or God's will for you in your life, is to be filled with the Spirit. And there'll be a transformation. And then secondly, this one may hurt a little bit, but it needs to be preached. Not only will there be a transformation, but only you know this. Notice with me at verse number, well, let's see here. Let's back up to verse 17. Wherefore ye be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking unto yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. So not only will there be a transformation, but secondly, you want to know how that you're filled with the Spirit? It simply means this, that there will be a continued growth. Hey, only you know this. Are you growing? Do you know a baby cannot grow except it have milk? But do you know that that baby, once it becomes a toddler, milk does not fill that baby up? Some of you new mothers know what I'm talking about. The milk's not working. They don't sleep. So what do you do? You put some cereal in it to thicken the milk up. You can do that, preacher. Well, I don't, but I know women that did. My wife did it. She did it just because she was tired of the babies waking up after two hours. She needed sleep and rest. And notice I said she because she, she wouldn't let me help with the, the twins. You ask her, I, listen, I'd try my best. She's so stubborn, she says, I've got this, I don't need you, sticking two bottles in at one time. But she would give them cereal to thicken it up. But you know what, that milk and that cereal, there came a time when that didn't work. Then they got on the baby food. Hey, Michaela ate so much butternut squash that we thought her liver was shutting down, she turns to yellow. I'm ta you talk about a tan. That girl had a tan. But the problem was the tan was from the inside out. Her eyes were yellow. Her skin was yellow. Her toes, the bottom of her feet were yellow. We thought, my God, something is wrong with Michaela. But what it was, was all she would eat was butternut squash. Baby food. Is that not true? But there come a time when that wore off because she had to grow. Then she got a taste of homemade sausage gravy. What a way to break a kid from Gerber baby food. The good stuff. Sausage gravy. But it got to a point that that wasn't good enough. Then she put in the biscuits. 
I am preaching this morning. <laughs> You're just not getting it. <laughs> you don't think that I got this, so, this size by not eating, do you? The problem with it, my growth, it sort of went haywire. But we all get to a point where you stop growing. So what are you going to do to continue growing? And can I say this? There should never ever be a, a time this side of heaven where a Christian says, I have grown enough. I have got enough. I don't need any more of what God has to give me. Can I tell you, I'm just beginning to grow in God. Yes, I've seen a lot of ups. I've seen a lot of downs. I've been through things a lot of people wouldn't go through. But can I tell you, with, through it all, God has showed me His marvelous grace, His unconditional love, and His mercy. And you know what? Because of that, I have grown. I've been through the trials of life. I've seen things that I didn't want to see. But through those things, I begin to grow and continue to grow as a Christian. And that means this. The Spirit of God has allowed that to happen. So I asked you this morning, are you filled with the Spirit of God? Has there been a change in your life? And has that change been consistent? And two, are you growing? I've seen people on this journey 30, 40, 50 years that showed prominent growth, but after a certain time, the growth stopped. And can I tell you something, church? If you're not growing, you're not filled with the Spirit of God. All of us can learn something from God. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, and I'll close. But grow. Peter says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory. One of the saddest Comments that have ever made been made to me as a Christian as a preacher and as a pastor When someone says and makes this statement you don't have to worry about me I know preachers That said you don't have to worry about me That are no longer preaching the gospel Because they stopped growing I've known people that's been on the old holy highway for years Make the statement, you don't have to worry about me, only to find out that today they are no longer serving God. You want to know why? Because they stopped growing. We're never too old to grow in the Lord. My daddy told me this, and I'll close. You're never too old for me to spank your hide. And it evened at the age of 77. When my daddy was on his deathbed, I still believe that my daddy could correct me. Matter of fact, he did. He took us boys out on the porch and he scolded us a day or two before he passed. Told us what we needed to do and make sure we don't do something else. That's the love of a father. That's growing in the relationship that you have. As we stand this morning, Sister Kennedy comes to get a song. Let me ask you, church, are you growing? Are you filled with the Spirit of God? Has there been a change in your life? Last week, we, we've been praying for revival. And we thought last week that we would maybe take off in revival last Sunday night. And had it been up to me, I would have said it and we'd have done it. But the problem would have been this. It would have been of me and not of God. I'm thankful that we listen to the Spirit of God. You know what that means? The Spirit of God is still working in this church. Because had we continued and said we're going to start revival, we would have been trying to have revival in the midst of burying one of the dearest members of this church. You see the importance of listening to the Spirit? Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Today may be the last opportunity you have to listen to the Spirit of God. And what He says to you is this, will you listen? As you bow your heads this morning, as she plays quietly, 
Has there been a change made in your life? And are you growing in that change? And if you can say no.